Good afternoon. Welcome to Frankfurt High School and to all of the hot dog alumni, welcome home. Once a hot dog, always a hot dog. I am Steve Edwards, the very proud principal of Frankfurt High School, one of the best high schools in the state of Indiana. I'm very excited for today. Adding another 11 people to our Hall of Fame is just super exciting. To get this show on the road at this time, I'm gonna introduce you to our superintendent for the community schools of Frankfurt, Mr. Don DeWeese. Good afternoon. Uh, before I introduce our, our master of ceremony, I just want to uh, straighten something out. This is the Hall of Fame induction. This is not the wrestling sectional. So if you're looking for the wrestling sectional, it's over. Okay. Today, it's my honor to uh, introduce our master of ceremonies. Our MC today is Tyler Stock. Uh, Tyler is a 2005 graduate of Frankfurt High School. Um, after being a three-sport athlete, key club, orchestra member, um, he decided to go to Butler. Graduated Butler 2009, and uh, he had a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism. Um, he goes out and he works uh, at Hillenbrand. He, he works for uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Becky Skillman. Um, so this young man has done a lot of great things. Um, one of the most important, he has a wonderful family. Uh, his wife, Annie, they have uh, three children, Cecilia, Felicity, and Noah. And uh, they proudly live in North Vernon, Indiana, which is in Jennings County down in southeastern uh, and, and we know us folks from southern Indiana. We, we, a lot of good people from southern Indiana. Um, Tyler right now is, is a real estate broker. He works for Coldwell Banker. And uh, would you please welcome our Master of Ceremonies, Tyler Stock. Thank you, Dr. DeWeese. As I was telling him, uh, he did a great job uh, memorizing that. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be quite that impressive, but I appreciate the uh, kind words. So, good afternoon and welcome to the induction ceremony for the second class of the Frankfurt High School Hot Dog Alumni Hall of Fame. To the alumni, guests, school administrators, previous Hall of Fame inductees, and to Mayor Chris McBarnes, welcome. And to the inductees here on the stage, I'm gonna reiterate what Principal Ed Edwards said and welcome home. We're glad that you guys came. I know a lot of you guys came from many miles. Maybe it's been a while since you've been back. Maybe you've never been here before because you're representing somebody else. We're just beyond excited to have you here today. Uh, this is a proud day for us hot dogs. Uh, last year was a tremendous success and we're just glad to welcome you into this exclusive club. Aren't we blessed to have first-class facilities such as this auditorium? Oftentimes in life, we take these things for granted until they, we go away and then come back to realize just how good we had it. This high school auditorium, which feels more like a professional theater, has hosted many first-rate performances, such as 48 years of Indiana's Junior Miss program, annual high school musicals, the 1998 version of Godspell resonates with me personally, and we all have memories of big broadcasts. Of course, Red Barn Summer Theater grew its roots in this very auditorium. Speaking of Red Barn, I'm really glad we started the ceremony on time. Rumor has it Martin Henderson, which many of you probably know, once broke a wooden baseball bat against the back wall of the school for starting a production late. So Mr. Taylor, don't get any ideas. <laughs> But this isn't the only great venue us hot dogs have to show off. Tonight, you'll get to enjoy another first-class facility just a few steps away at the iconic Everett Case Arena and indulge in Indiana high school basketball. So whether you still live in Frankfurt or have been gone for 50 years, please know you are always welcome back. In just a few minutes, you are about to join a very prestigious and exclusive club of hot dogs 
We, the Board of Directors, hope you will recognize the importance of this moment. Those involved with the inception of the Hall of Fame intentionally designed it to be the best of the best and of the highest honor. In fact, when I saw the caliber of hot dogs that have been selected to the Hall of Fame, I quickly realized I'm never going to get in, so I asked to be the MC because I figured that's as close as I'm going to get. <laughs> For a small town in Indiana, Frankfurt has produced some very impressive alumni. I'm kind of a number nerd, so let's take a moment to break down the first two Hall of Fame classes by the numbers. Out of what will be 26 inductees, seven are military veterans, six state champions, five professional actors, musicians, radio and TV personalities, four doctors, three members of the Indiana High School Basketball Hall of Fame, two local business owners still in operation today, and one billionaire. Yes, that's billion with a B. These statistics are very important because they demonstrate to generations of hot dogs and future hot dogs that you can achieve anything you set your mind to, regardless of where you come from. So to the second class of hot dog alumni, congratulations on this highest honor. You make us all proud to call ourselves hot dogs. Now, I know you're not all here to listen to me speak for three hours, so we're going to get right into the introduction of each of our Hall of Fame inductees because what they have to say is way more valuable than what I have to say. A few housekeeping uh, items before we get into uh, the introduction of our first member. I'm going to introduce um, each person one by one. There'll be a short video that'll be uh, displayed here to my left. Uh, that has been put together by the high school radio and TV class. After the, uh, while the inductee is making their way to the podium, that will, that will play. They will provide their remarks and then will be presented with a plaque and have a photo with Don Rusk, chairman of the Hall of Fame Board of Directors. We will then recognize each inductee with a final round of applause. With that, our first inductee. Charles Aidman. He graduated in 1942 and headed to DePaul University in Chicago, where at the time they offered free instruction for men and women seeking war-related jobs and Navy officer training for World War II. It was while at DePaul, the theater director told Aidman he had a role for him in their current production. His acting career exploded from there, and as they say in Hollywood, the rest is history. Here today to represent Mr. Aidman is another highly successful hot dog theater alum, Mr. Mike Clausen. Hi, good afternoon. I have to mark out a bunch of stuff that Stock already said. Um, I apologize in advance, I've had a bit of a cold. <clears throat> I could start coughing at any time. I asked Dr. Beardsley for some advice, but all he did was move his chair. When I was a kid, all the neighborhood gang would go down to Dorner's Park, walk the pipe across Prairie Creek and play army. Specifically, we would charge up a hill named after a great Korean war movie called Pork Chop Hill. You may think this has nothing to do with anything, but I'm gonna get to it in a minute. Charles Leonard Aidman was born January 21st, 1925, the son of George and Etta Aidman. He lived right over here on Clinton Street near Hoke, and all I could think of today with this weather is that must have been a long, cold walk downtown when you had to walk to the old high school in the winter.
Charlie, as he was known back then, was a member of the High Life staff, the Cauldron staff, JV basketball, the tennis team, and was active in student politics. This is the title stock part that I'll skip, but he went to DePaul, was asked to be in a play, said okay, and the entire course of his life changed. He served in the Navy during World War II. When it ended, he studied theater at Indiana University. He moved to New York City and studied with famed acting coach Sanford Meisner at the Neighborhood Playhouse. Charles appeared in off-Broadway plays The Cretan Women and Career before starring in Desire Under the Elms on Broadway, directed by the legendary Harold Clerman. At that time, the mid-1950s, many of the network television programs were being shot in New York. Charles transitioned into television, appearing on shows like Goodyear Playhouse, Robert Montgomery Presents, and Craft Theater. In 1959, Hollywood made the classic war movie, Pork Chop Hill. I told you. Starring Gregory Peck, Rip Torn, George Pappard, and as Lieutenant Harold, Charles Aidman in his first feature film. About that time, Charles relocated to Los Angeles. At UCLA, Charles adapted Edgar Lee Masters' Spoon River Anthology for the stage, a production he also directed, wrote lyrics for, and starred in. Interestingly enough, the success of the play sent him back to Broadway, where Spoon River Anthology played for 111 performances and is still performed in theater schools and universities around the world. Now, for most actors, if I stopped right now, this would be a fairly impressive resume. But Charlie Aidman was just getting started. Over the next 40 years, he would act in 15 feature films, and over 150 different TV shows, frequently appearing in several episodes of a series. But more than that, most of the programs Charles appeared in became a part of our nation's popular cultural history. I'm going to read you just a few so you can see what I mean. Perry Mason, Bonanza, four appearances on Have Gun Will Travel, three appearances on Wagon Train. On a famous episode of The Dick Van Dyke Show, he played a hypnotist who accidentally hypnotizes Rob at a party. On a well-known episode of The Twilight Zone, Charles played one of three lost astronauts along with Jim Hutton and Rod Taylor. On The Andy Griffiths Show, Charles played Frank Smith, whose friendship with Helen Crump brought out Andy's seldom seen jealous side. A brief commercial timeout. Charles was a very well-known voiceover artist. If you watched network television in the 80s, you heard his voice on many, many commercials. And if you went to see a movie, odds are you heard Charles narrating one of his many movie preview trailers. The Fugitive, Kojak, The Rockford Files, Gomer Pyle, USMC, Mission Impossible. On the Wild Wild West, Charles replaced ailing co-star Ross Martin for four episodes. The Six Million Dollar Man, Little House on the Prairie. On an episode of All in the Family, Charles played the father-in-law of Lionel Jefferson, much to the dismay of Archie Bunker and George Jefferson. The Mod Squad, Kung Fu, Bosom Buddies, Dallas. On a memorable episode of MASH, Charles played Colonel Bloodworth, who angered Hawkeye with his cold-blooded casualty uh, predictions. And when The Twilight Zone was brought back in 1985, Charles returned to the show and took over the narrator role from the late Rod Serling. He completed over 30 episodes. Charles Aidman died November 7, 1993 at the age of 68 in Beverly Hills, California. On behalf of Charles Aidman, I'd like to thank the Frankfurt Education Foundation, Don Stock, Don Rusk, Joan L. Smith, Craig Mundell, and all of the Alumni Hall of Fame board members, as well as Principal Edwards, Mike Taylor, and the staff and students here at the high school for this recognition. And now we're going to see some brief examples of Charles's work that were compiled by the high school, radio, and television department. You're traveling to another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Oh, dog again. Mark, you boy, here. Oh, Mel, can't we? Yeah, I have to be the dog. We can't take the chance of going in there. Mark, 
You boy, you man. He's doing it. Man, what I want. Come on, boy. You see that little girl over there? That's the little girl that Lyle's going to marry. Yeah, I know. You know who that lady is hugging her? No. She's my wife. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you. How do you do? Mrs. Jefferson? Mr. Jefferson? No, it's just take it easy or they think we're really fighting. Who cares what? Thing. Oh, come on now, Helen. We've run into his kind before, black and white, and we've always been able to handle them. Sure, because we never let them walk all over us. We did something about it. You want me to do something about it? All right, I am going to do something about it right now. Mr. Jefferson. <laughs> yes. May I add this dance? Oh, you certainly may. Do we? Sorry, he asked me first. <laughs> what would you expect in the way of casualties in the next 24 hours? I think that you'll find that these figures reflect my customary pinpoint accuracy. Paul, can you go just a little faster? You want it fast or you want it round? The push begins at 0900. Now we're in for bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hill 403 is a maze of trenches, foxholes, and craters. By calculating a division of men, supported in depth by artillery, mortar fire, and tanks, against seasoned troops also backed by artillery, we figure a grand total of 280 to 290 casualties passing through this unit. Our next inductee is Dr. Frank Beardsley. He graduated in 1943, then headed to Wabash College and IU Medical School. Dr. Beardsley spent 36 years caring for many Frankfurt families. Beyond his medical practice, Dr. Beardsley was a major philanthropist. His passion, Kiwanis, including the creation of Key Club right here at Frankfurt High School. Dr. Beardsley has been a valuable member of this community for decades and has made a personal mission out of keeping the legacy of Everett Case alive, especially since I'm told his mother wouldn't let him play basketball for fear he'd get hurt, despite having quite a smooth jump shot. Without further ado, Dr. Frank Beardsley. Okay, uh, I'd like to say a couple of words about uh, uh, the last uh, 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 recipient, uh, Charlie Aidman. Uh, when he, he was in the class of uh, 42, and I was in the class of 43, and close to his graduation, he started singing this little song. Reuben, Reuben, I've been thinking what a thrill it's going to be not to be associated with a class of 43 there. <laughs> he was a good guy. <laughs> um, I was told that when you get to a certain age, uh, you begin to have trouble with memory, so you need to have a, uh, a, uh, a few notes uh, if you're gonna talk about anything. I am at that certain age. Uh, uh, I have had many happy moments. Uh, I, I'm happy to today. I'm, I'm happy that uh, I'm being inducted to the Frankfurt High School Hall of Fame. And I'm always happy that the dear Lord uh, saw fit to place me in Frankfurt, Indiana for my hometown. 
I was born in the Clinton County Hospital in 1925, and I lived the next 96 year, 93 years in Frankfurt, except for three years in the Navy and nine years uh, getting a little extra uh, education after I graduated from, from uh, uh, Frankfurt. My days in Frankfurt High Schools were great. I had a good education, good teachers, uh, good sports, and good uh, entertainment. Adequate facilities, but not anything like we got today. This is a wonderful facility that they have just uh, uh, made, made uh, as nice as any high school in the state of Indiana. Um, I played in the band, and uh, we marched uh, uh, at, uh, for all the football games for the Frankfurt Nighthawks at Stott Field. And then we went to Howard Hall and uh, watched the Fa Frankfurt Fighting Five play basketball. We eventually dropped those two names and became hot dogs, and that's where we are today. Uh, it was always uh, fun playing at Howard Hall because we won most of our games under uh, Coach uh, uh, Case. Uh, Case meant more uh, uh, promoting Frankfurt than anybody that ever lived. Um, I have... Um, given uh, speeches in a lot of the groups about Case. And uh, when the movie um, uh, Blue Chips was filmed uh, here in Frankfurt in 1954, I was asked to write a little book about, uh, a little booklet uh, about a Everett Case. And um, uh, it sold at the door for a dollar and, they, uh, and uh, uh, all the monies went to charity. Uh, over, th over 200 books were sold uh, there and I still have a few left. And, if, <laughs> And uh, if anybody would like to have uh, one of those books, I, I would be glad to uh, provide one. Just let me know, and I'll, I'll make sure you get one. I also have a lot of um, uh, material I've used to make speeches on about every case. And um, uh, I'd like to, uh, if anyone would like to continue uh, after, uh, after I... Uh, 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 quit, uh, which I've done now. Uh, they're, they're welcome to all of my material. Uh, I started the practice of medicine uh, on my 30th birthday, July the 8th, 1955. My dad died a few, uh, two months before uh, uh, I finished my internship. We planned to practice to be, together, so I took over his practice. There was a Frank Allen, Be Dr. Frank Allen Beardsley practicing medicine in Frankfurt from 1921 to 1991. I don't think anybody ever enjoyed the practice of medicine uh, more than I did. Uh, um, I delivered lots of babies, uh, gave lots of anesthetics, uh, off, uh, house calls galore, a big uh, uh, office practice, uh, and um, got pretty tired. Uh, 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 I think the fav favorite part of uh, my practice was obstetrics. I was always honored when a, a lady would uh, honor me, uh, would uh, uh, choose me to, to participate uh, in that wonderful event. Uh, uh, today, uh, I often, uh, whether, whether in a store or wherever, a lady will come up to me and say, you delivered me, and uh, I kind of like that. Uh, I noticed a gal came in this, uh, this afternoon by the name of Millie Stoops. Uh, she was my uh, nurse for 97 years, 97 years, and she was a wonderful gal. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I retired my practice in 1991. They say if you enjoy what you're doing, you never have to work, and that sure uh, fits me to a T. Um, I, I joined the uh, Fun Time Band in, in, the, uh, in the 1970s and uh, played uh, with them for the next uh, 75 years uh, or so, retiring last year. Uh, there have been five generations of Beardsleys that have attended uh, Frankfurt schools. Uh, the first was my father in 1898 at the Fifth Ward, which became Riley uh, Grade School. Uh, I was in the second generation. Uh, the four, the, the uh, four generations produced uh, five physicians. Um, 
Don't ever think we forget about Frankfurt. I'm, I'm from the class of 1943, and we just had our 75th reunion at Hoops last summer. How about that? That's it. <laughs> When you're old, you forget I'm supposed to say it. Dr. Beardsley, everybody. <laughs> Our next inductee is Lieutenant General J. Kelly. He graduated in 1959 and enlisted in the Air Force Academy. General Kelly retired in 1996 after a very decorated military career. Lieutenant Kelly has been awarded the Legion of Merit and the Defense Superior Service Medal for exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding services to the United States government. On behalf of everyone here, thank you for your services to this country and for protecting our freedoms, Lieutenant Kelly. Please join me in giving Lieutenant J. Kelly a warm hot dog welcome. Thank you, Don Ross and Don Stock, for the uh, honor and uh, the Hall of Fame committee. Um, and congratulations to my fellow honorees and to my wife, Ho Sook, out there, uh, the lady that lights up my solar, pan solar panels and charges my batteries. I love you, dear. Um, you may have noticed a parachute picture in that thing. There's a number you ain't got. National Collegiate Champion Skydiving Accuracy, 1964. First one from the Air Force Academy. That's another, another number. Okay. Uh, seems like just the other day that uh, I was here, good friends, good times, but not the same high school. We were downtown, of course. But uh, I'm reminded of so many things. Uh, basketball, uh, Frank talked about that a little bit. Uh, Frankfurt basketball and playing here for uh, George Bradfield and Sam Ranzino and Bill Kukoy back in the day is one of the things that got me to the Air Force Academy, along with my good friend from Muncie. Uh, enjoyed that greatly. Uh, but it doesn't hold a candle, you know. Uh, when you see that movie, Hoosiers, we all saw that thing talking about Milan, place on that. It didn't hold nothing to uh, the community spirit involved in Frankfurt basketball when you went to Estel Rule's barber shop Saturday morning. So I had gotten that chair, and I remember this so well, so many times. He'd be sitting there, and he'd be snipping away, and then he'd get down in your ear, and he said, never leave your feet to block a shot. <laughs> and then, then he'd back off, and he'd snip a little bit. Did you hear me? I said, what about a jump shot? <laughs> Same answer, never leave your feet. And then he'd snip a little bit more, and then he'd say, you always pivot to your left and shoot with your right. Yes, well, I'm right-handed. Learn your left hand. Pivot the other way. I mean, it was criticism, but it was coaching in Estelle Rules Washington Barbershop, which some of you probably remember. But I remember the other part about being here, and that was Delamod Sanders teaching me algebra. And I remember Hattie Bell Campbell teaching me English. I wondered why three women with three names had that kind of thing back then, but I never figured that out. Uh, Bob Schilling uh, was trigonometry, and uh, Doc Belcher, chemistry. 
and Doc had a stub finger. And if he was walking down the aisle doing, you were doing a program, a little problem at your desk, and he didn't like what he saw you doing, he'd stick that stub right in your ear. And then he'd stick it in, did you remember what I said, boy? And then you'd say, yes, sir. And then he'd give it a twist. Well, wow, there's good old days. We all learned a lot back then. And, uh, and I've got a lot to be thankful for. Uh, but I stand here today wearing this uniform not to commemorate my service, but to remind us all of all the Frankfurt hot dogs who have served their country in uniform. And the first responders, police, medical, nurses, paramedics, EMTs, firefighters, all of them. We need to remember all of them that have been Frankfurt hot dogs also. So let's do that. God bless America and God bless the Frankfurt hot dogs. One more time, Lieutenant General Jay Kelly. Our next inductee, Dr. Patrick Kersey. He graduated valedictorian in 1986, then headed to IU where he graduated from medical school. He's the medical director for St. Vincent Sports Performance. Dr. Kersey has made a name for himself in the area of sports medicine including roles as the Indianapolis Colts team physician, creator of the Indiana Sports Concussion Network, and medical director of the BMW Golf Tournament. Dr. Kersey is going to give us the inside scoop on Peyton Manning. Our next inductee, Dr. Patrick Kersey. Thank you very much. Uh, very honored to be here today and definitely want to take the opportunity to thank the uh, Hot Dog Alumni Committee uh, for considering uh, me. Thank all of uh, the inductees and their families today, Frankfurt Community Schools as well, as well as uh, all the Frankfurt alumni and friends here today. Um, a little humbled being up here. Uh, feel a little young to be up here for sure. Uh, Definitely grew up my entire life wanting to be a hot dog. <clears throat> That's for sure. From about age five or six, I had the opportunity to be able to hitch along uh, on the Frankfurt basketball train with my father being one of the assistant coaches. And, and my objective was to be a hot dog and play for Coach Milholland. That's really what my objective was. Uh, I wanted to play for a sectional champ, wanted to get to play in Mackey Arena. And I was fortunate enough to get to do all that. Um, mostly as a ride-along, uh, when I realized that I was using a Hoosiers reference, I was a little more like Ollie than I was like Jimmy. Unfortunately, suffered an injury when I was a senior, which was probably my best calling. Uh, kind of directed me to the fact that education was probably where I was going to be best served, but I still wanted to find a way to, to do that associated around the world of sports. So. Sports medicine wasn't really a, a career opportunity back then, and it started to be blossoming just at the time as I was growing up, and kind of opportunity uh, presented itself to me at a good time. So coming from a world of many educators, uh, anyone who knows much about my family, uh, I can tell you that we come from about three or four generations of educators. Uh, my parents, my parents' parents, uh, all were teachers. Uh, my aunts and uncles, uh, cousins, all teachers. Uh, and with that being said, there were a lot of lessons to be learned uh, on many occasions. Uh, couldn't tell you the number of lessons that I was given uh, at the dinner table or at uh, family outings, but uh, in general, I think those were all very, very uh, important. And I definitely want to take the opportunity to thank my family who's here today. 
my wife, Jennifer, uh, my kids, uh, Lily, Charlie, Henry, and Lucy. A couple of them are at events today, unfortunately. Uh, my sister, Kelly, her husband, Brian, and uh, got my aunt here with me today, a couple of cousins, and very proud to have them uh, be here and represent me uh, today as well. Um, along that educational line, uh, my grandfather, Robert Gibbs, uh, and grandmother, uh, Margaret Gibbs, who both were teachers, educators, uh, administrators throughout the Frankfurt Community Schools, uh, set, definitely set me off in a direction that uh, was probably most important uh, to my career development uh, in the line of education. Um, always was taught uh, to do the right thing. I tried that most of the time. I'm not sure I did a great job at it, but I did the best I could and continue to try. Never stop learning. Uh, I think it's important for us uh, to understand that our education continues to go on no matter how old we are or where we are. Pass that on. Pass on that information that you've been able to learn and then continue to keep trying to do the right thing. I think those are great lessons uh, for us all to hear and to learn. Um, I think I'm actually the product of great role models. Um, an example of what positive influence can be and I think I was uh, the recipient of growing up in a community that uh, not only got behind uh, the basketball team, the community, uh, the school, but generally just the community of Frankfort and Clinton County. And I wanted to recognize a few of those people who probably were a great influence to me and gave me great guidance and direction. Uh, Dad always used to point out people of, of reference to me that I think he wanted me to model or, or look up to. And, and I think those are some pretty good role models. People like David Moore, Mike Sharp, Dave Ricker, Rick Wade, the Beardsley Boys, Rick Swing, Kevin Scheid, Albert Hendricks, Tom Miller, Andy Dethridge, Scott Stewart, and Aunt, uh, Jason Bricker. All these guys are people that I probably admired uh, throughout my life and tried to model myself after a bit. I was definitely the recipient of some incredible education. Um, teachers that had a great influence on me were Rex Bowman, Fred Downs, Ron Rucker, Ken Stewart, Art Page, Connie Milholland, Terry Pletch. I'm not sure if she was a very good teacher, but I thought she was pretty cool. <laughs> Bob Schilling, who also got mentioned earlier, Jack Palmer, Ron Shepard. Uh, had some incredible coaching influences. Uh, a few of the guys mentioned above were also coaches of mine, but Coach Milholland, uh, John Sloggett from Clinton Central, uh, Danny Cass from Clinton Prairie, and, and Bob Knapp from Rossville. I thought those were all incredible coaches and had great influence. Um, I've been blessed to be influenced by some incredible people. First, Dr. Beardsley. Pretty cool to be able to stand up here with someone you'd call your hero. I wanted to be Dr. Beersley growing up. I'm still trying. Art Reddick, whose wife was also from Frankfurt, Bonnie Baird, John McCarroll, uh, Bill Pullian, Peyton Manning, Adam Vinatieri, and Ralph Reef, a couple of those names you guys may recognize from their sports prowess. I was gonna tell an anecdotal story that I thought was pretty cool as a Frankfurt kid. I uh, got the opportunity to be on the field for a couple Super Bowls, and actually the second Super Bowl, we were getting ready to play the New Orleans Saints. It didn't end as well as we wanted to, but it was still a great experience. We were in Miami, and I'm standing in the tunnel back behind the players getting ready to go out and actually got caught up in a moment of daydreaming and, th and thought to myself, this is every kid's dream. Get to stand here for the opportunity to run out of the tunnel for the Super Bowl, how in the world did a kid from Frankfurt, Indiana get standing here? And just at that moment, as I'm daydreaming and thinking what in the heck's happened here, Peyton Manning put his arm on my, or hand on my shoulder and said, hey, you ready to go win the Super Bowl? And all I could think about is I'm not playing. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Got the opportunity to run out of the tunnel uh, with him with all the kind of cannons going off and fireworks and all those kind of things. It's quite a neat, unique experience and, and uh, thought about Franklin, Indiana at that time. I definitely feel like it's pretty 
feels silly, a bit awkward to be up here being recognized at my present age and, and where I am in my career because I'm certainly not finished. I think it's really cool to be able to stand up here with my hero, Dr. Beardsley. I've thought, Hall of Fame, what am I in the Hall of Fame for? I could probably be famous only for one thing, of being in the right place at the right time. Fortunes found me by accident uh, to a degree, but I think we make our own luck as time goes on. I think we're all generally intrigued about the world of sports, and I've had a unique perspective of that over the last 45 years, being able to be in locker rooms and stadiums and uh, in the back halls of places that most people don't get a chance to be. It probably gets a little too much credit for sure, that sports world, uh, maybe not deserving of all of its glory, but it definitely has a lot of influence. Um, I don't think I've done enough to probably receive this type of honor yet, uh, but I hope to continue to do the best I can to keep earning it. I'm very humbled and appreciated, appreciative of the recognition to be a true hot dog. I'm very proud to be a Frankfurt hot dog. I hope I continue to represent it very well, and I know that my dad would be pretty proud. Thank you. Dr. Patrick Kersey. Our next inductee, Cindy Ward Wine Martinez. She graduated in 1973. While a student at FHS, Cindy wrote the book on spirit as a cheerleader. Small in stature, she was mighty when it came to pep, school spirit, and encouraging teams and fans. Cindy was never afraid to be in front of any crowd, sharing her smile and enthusiasm. Senior year, Cindy and her family participated in the Ford and Exchange program, hosting and opening their home to a girl from Sweden. Cindy loved drama and, was, and the stage was where she did her interpretive dance, sang, and was an MC for big broadcast. She participated in school musicals and the senior class play. In her senior year book, she was identified as the vivacious Cindy Ward secretary of drama club. She continued this passion into her career where she was a mainstay on TV and radio in Indiana and Arizona. Here to represent the late Cindy Ward Wine Martinez are her sons John Settergren and Tyler Wine. Please give them a warm hot dog welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, really honored to be here uh, amongst giants uh, to uh, my right. Um, my mother loved this little town and uh, she certainly loved all the people in it. Um, she was definitely a pioneer in her field. Um, Mom had a, had a spirit and a heart that uh, just never stopped. Uh, she instilled that into uh, myself and my brother. Um, it was tough. We, uh, we lost mom last year, be a year this uh, March 30th. Uh, couldn't have done it with the great people of uh, this town. Um, wherever mom went, she was always a Frankfurt hot dog first, a Hoosier second, and uh, from Indiana third. So uh, Angel Martinez, uh, her husband, Andy Seifer, um, there during the last days, and so many other people. Uh, my mom would have been completely honored to be uh, inducted with her best friend, Karen uh, Miller. Um, so I want to thank uh, the people of Frankfurt, uh, the fellow uh, Hall of Fame inductees, um, and uh, the uh, committee for bestowing this uh, very uh, appreciative honor uh, amongst my mother. And uh, we we're very uh, honored and humbled. I'll let my brother say a couple words. Thank you so much. I won't take any more time, but mom loved this high school and the people here more than anything. Uh, from her time 
acting on stage in the Crucible uh, through her many radio performances and being on TV. Uh, she always seemed to be drawn back to Frankfurt. If we were in the state, we were coming to the Hot Dog Festival. Uh, couldn't get away from this place. And it's really the people that, that bring you back. It's uh, people like this that have done great things coming from, from this town that make you want to come back and spend it uh, summer after summer with, with all the, the hot dogs. So thank you very much from our family. Cindy Ward Wine Martinez. One more time. Well, since they're best friends, it's good that they're back to back here. So, our next inductee is Karen Miller. She graduated in 1973. The late Karen Miller was a CPA and she was also a trailblazer for women, serving as the first president of the Farmers Bank. Karen was also extremely involved in the community. She served on everything from the Frankfurt Main Street to the Chamber of Commerce, and even as an elder at the First Christian Church. Karen was a mentor and person of influence to many kids in Frankfurt, especially kids in my generation. You wouldn't have found a more passionate, caring, and loving person than Karen Miller. Today, to accept Karen's introduction into the Hall of Fame is her husband, Greg. Earlier this week, there was a large fire in Frankfurt downtown. Greg is a firefighter, and as most heroes do, ran into the building to take action. <clears throat> Greg was injured in the line of duty, but is still here today on behalf of his late wife. These are the kind of people the Millers are. Please give a big round of applause for both Karen and Greg Miller. a pleasure to be here today and as Dr. Kersey said it is humbling to be here to accept this for Karen when you look at the caliber of people who are here and present today it is truly blessed and we are truly blessed that we have individuals to set the standard for us not only in the past but for today and for the future Karen was a true hot dog. She was an archer first, and then she was a falcon, and then a hot dog. She went on to be a cardinal at Ball State, and then returned to be a hot dog. Since Karen's not here to speak for herself today, I thought it would be nice to have her speak through her journal. She journaled on a pretty regular basis about everything. Part of that I can share with you today. Karen starts out, and if you knew Karen, she was an individual that looked out at the hearts of everyone around her. Her pleasure came from communication, not being on time for sure, which she never was, but she cared so much about those around her. And I'd like to share a couple of things that she had to say. If only I had the power to lift each and every person to feel positive and uplifted 
and special about themselves. If I could just make them happy. She wrote again that says, my best qualities is that I smile easily and not really sure what my best qualities are because I feel like I don't let them out sometimes. And sometimes I feel like people may laugh. So I just don't let that out. She wrote again, my greatest fear is dying and not really living, regretting what I didn't do and the kindnesses that were unspoken and unsaid and that I failed God and the, and the world by living at a lower level than what my part was supposed to play. She wrote down her values, and these I agree with. She was enthusiastic, energized, had integrity. She was committed, compassionate, and kind. My chief aim in life is to help Frankfort, Clinton County, and all the people there to live to a higher level spiritually, compassionately, and economically. To live at a bigger level and raise the level for those in the whole world. To be big leaders and to live bigger lives. Don't make it hard, Karen. Just give up the old ways. She wrote a mission statement at one time, and I, this is actually, I, I found this um, in one of the many journals that she kept, and actually I got to read this for the first time. It said, what is my mission? This says, to love my husband and support him, to love God completely, fully with abandon, to lead others to know God in a personal, an intimate way to appreciate the gifts that God has given, to use them to his glory, to be better than what God intended for my life, to stretch the limits, to stretch the boundaries so that others will see that they too are capable of outstanding service and quality of life. To listen to people in need. And how do I do that? Oh Lord, I really want my life to count for you so that when I die, I will hear, hear well done, good and faithful spirit, kindness, gentleness, self-control, humble, meekness, unconditional love, boldness, proactive, don't be afraid, okay, fear, but go ahead and overcome my fears, fearlessly, be who I am, and not be afraid of the outcome. So much in journals that we read about individuals, and the thing will be is that not only those who are sitting here, but those that are sitting out here, of what will be said about you one day. A story, the last story that I'll share with you will be a story that when Karen was in the hospital, and I reflected this story the day of her funeral, but I think it's worth retelling, is that Karen was, we were working to bring Karen home uh, and she was still in the hospital. And her doctor, actually her surgeon in Indianapolis, uh, Karen had a special rapport with this doctor. Um, they would trade pictures of um, 
her ski trips and trade pictures with his kids dressed up for Halloween. And he came in Karen's room the day that we were to bring her home. And I saw him look over at her and I saw a tear come down uh, his cheek. And that doctor said, I meet a lot of people in this profession, but few of them change you. And I know if Karen were here today, her challenge to you would be, how will you change? And how will you take those changes to affect those around you? We're given so many opportunities in life. Some we take advantage of and some we don't. I think we have advantages of person, persons who are sitting here today from little Frankfort, Indiana, that we sometimes wonder what goals we can attain. I think it's evident of the class that had come through last year and the classes that are present here today that you see the caliber that can come from Frankfort, Indiana, that can live elsewhere and return home here. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Our next inductee, Mr. Jim Miner. He graduated in 1937. Miner was one of the state's top athletes, winning the 1936 Basketball State Championship and the 1937 Track and Field State title in pole vault. But those championships are hardly his biggest accomplishments. Serving in World War II, he was wounded not once, but twice, in a firefight against the Axis in southern France. In true hot dog spirit, he never quit, and he continued to fight back, leading his platoon to finish the mission. For his courage and leadership on that day in 1944, Miner received the Purple Heart and the Silver Star for gallantry. After the war, Miner came back to Frankfurt, where he worked, lived, and volunteered. Jim Miner, champion, hero, community servant. Please welcome to the podium Steve Miner, son of Jim, to accept his father's induction into the Hall of Fame. Good afternoon. Um, um, I'm a hot dog alumni from Frankfurt, class of 1967, and I'm privileged to represent the Miner family um, for my father's induction into the Frankfurt High School Hall of Fame. I want to thank Chairman Don Stock, the Hall of Fame committee, my brother-in-law, Steve Bach, who's also an alumni a few years later than me here at Frankfurt, for letting us know about this Hall of Fame. And my brother, I want to thank a special thanks, my brother Rich Miner, who lives here in Frankfurt and um, compiled the bulk of information and, and information and, and photos that the company requested, committee requested. I want to briefly share with you um, a couple chapters that have been referred to already in my, my father's experience. He is a lifelong Frankfurt resident. He was born in Frankfurt in 1918. He grew up here, he lived on Green Street, and he started to show some athletic ability. And uh, 
he is, I'll read a few things. He certainly was a member of the 1936 Indiana High School Basketball State Champion. He was starting guard on that team, coached by Everett Case. And I think Jay McQuarrie, Ralph Vaughn coming up later, um, maybe another fellow also on that team are already in the hall. Uh, I've seen this movie Hoosiers, I don't know how many times. And it just, it, it makes me cry every time I, I see that. And I, I, I just think of this town of Frankfurt rising up and um, it's just a great memory. But you know, basketball wasn't the only thing that he did. He also played um, several sports in track and field. Um, and one of his specialties was pole vault. And in 1937, when he was a senior, he cleared 12 feet, 10 inches using a bamboo pole. Now, Colton Crom would, uh, has been to our house. He's seen a lot of these medals and awards that, that dad has acquired in track and field, but he, he can't get over this bamboo pole. Uh, I think dad told me one time that these poles, a lot of them came out of rugs that were rolled up on this pole. But um, I would imagine a, not much flex in a bamboo pole, not like fiberglass and maybe some graphite that Colton is using, but it's nice to know that uh, the pole vault record is staying here with Frankfurt. That record that dad said in 1937 stood as a Frankfurt record for around 40 years until someone in the 70s finally vaulted higher than that. And now we know uh, the, the record still stands here at Frankfurt with, with Colton's record at 17, six and some odd inches, I think, but anyway. Not only that, he was a football player too, and he did a little bit of everything for the Nighthawks back then in 37. He was a quarterback, halfback, runned punts, punted. He was so good that he eventually got a Division I scholarship to the University of Wisconsin. So he goes off to play football for Wisconsin, and then comes World War II, and he enlisted in 1942. And then in 1944, he was Staff Sergeant Jim Miner, and circumstances had him in southern France on the German border in the mountains, directing a squad of men, defending an operation post that was on the hillside. Now this area in France and Germany on the border historically has been a, a location where battles have taken place going back to Napoleon. It's a key entry point into France. There was a little saddle there. They were up on the hillside and this German patrol decided to come on and attack them early one morning. Um, apparently it was pretty hairy. The, uh, the, the book that describes this battle um, says that it was a firefight, but uh, as said earlier, uh, dad um, did what he had to do and uh, repelled the attack and uh, was awarded the Silver Star, which is the third highest medal for honor and gallantry in action behind the Medal of Honor and the Army Cross. So dad uh, recovered from his wounds in France and uh, uh, processed out of the Army in 1945. Um, then he returns to Frankfurt. He took a job as an insurance agent, which he kept for 45 years. He married a wonderful woman from Michigan town named Mary Beth Thompson. And um, they raised two sons, myself and my brother Rich. He was faithful to his wife for over 50 years. He was active in the community in many ways and was instrumental in starting the elementary school safety patrol. But he was a quiet man and he seldom spoke about his athletic career, never talked about World War II and that experience but he was proud and supportive of his two sons and their athletic pursuits. It's very ironic, you know, of all the sports that he played, the, two, the sport that my brother and I saw a few days of sunshine on us in baseball, but it's something that he really did. And I don't think in high school it was around at that time. But um, he passed away in 1998 at the age of 79. He, he's a rest. Here he's at rest here at Bunnell Cemetery. So we have athletics and World War II, but I think maybe for me, and I'm sure for my brother Rich, maybe his greatest accomplishment was that he was a husband, a father, a lifelong citizen of Frankfurt. Extraordinary events for sure, but great accomplishments right here at home and being a very special dad to him and me. And uh, the Miner family is grateful 
for the Hall of Fame honor bestowed on Jim H. Minor. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Jim Miner, everybody. Our next inductee is Rawlings Rawl Ransom. He graduated in 1938. Mr. Ransom bled hot dog blue. And when you think of Frankfurt, there are several family names that instantly come to mind. Beardsleys and Ransoms are certainly right there at the top of the list. Nearly everyone in this room has been impacted by the Ransom family in some capacity, whether it was buying materials from Kramer Lumber, having Rawl's son referee a football game, or having his daughter-in-law as your teacher. Mr. Ransom led a family of city servants, where he led that family by example. If it wasn't for his vision, several initiatives wouldn't have been started such as the Economic Development Corporation, the Industrial Park, the Frankfurt Municipal Airport, and the Clinton County United Way. Small towns thrive on their sense of community and those who are willing to dedicate their time for the betterment of all. Raul Ransom was an iconic member of our community, not only for the initiatives he started, but also for the family of city servants, which he led. Give a warm hot dog welcome to Rawls children, Jack, Sally, and Tom, as they represent their father on this very deserving induction. Thank you to the Hall of Fame for recognizing our dad. Uh, I'm not sure it's safe having my brother stand behind me. <laughs> I'm Sally Ransom Myers. I'm the only daughter of Raw Ransom. I'm one of three children that Raw and Rosemary Ransom had. I have two brothers, Tom and Jack, and you'll hear from them shortly. Raw was a family man, and in my story about Raw, you're going to hear as much about our mother because she was a very important part and partner with daddy for over 50 years. Rawlings Vanessa Ransom was born on March 19, 1920 to Blanche Emma Kramer and Tim Vanessa Ransom. Rawl had two brothers, Jack and Bill. Jack passed away as an infant and Bill now lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Rawl attended Riley Elementary and Frankfurt High School. During his freshman year in high school, he met this young lady, Rosemary Walton, and thus began their 50 plus year romance. Rawl graduated from high school in 1938 and attended Wabash College, where he was a member of Phi Gamma Delta fraternity. Rawl and Rose were married in 1941, and within a year after they were married, Daddy was called into the service, serving in the Army during World War II. He served for the next three years. Even after the war and after Dad's Army buddies and he had parted company and went back to their respective homes, for the next 50 years, each uh, second weekend in September, Mother and Dad would head to their Army reunion. My parents would not miss this weekend for anything for um, they, Daddy had formed such a bond with these men. After Mom passed away, Jack had the privilege of attending uh, some of the Army reunions with Dad. This group of men had been through an amazing time and a tough time together, and they had such support and love for each other that they wouldn't miss gathering each year. 
During and after the war, Rawls family increased, beginning with me, then Tom, and then Jack. Following his discharge, they set up their first home at the corner of Boone and Williams Street in a little white house. Kramer Lumber Company, a family-owned business since 1872, was calling my dad. He began working there in the late 40s with my grandfather, Tim, and with Tim's father-in-law. Raul put in many long hours and years at Kramer's, and he never fully retired. He kept his office at the lumber yard, and as the years went by, his main duty was to go to the post office each morning and pick up the mail. Many people often said to me and wondered, how could Raul be in the lumber hardware business for so many years when he wasn't any more of a handyman than what he was? Raul worked six days a week at the lumber yard, for the lumber yard was open until noon on Saturday, which is changed, of course, now. He was always off on Saturday at one o'clock to play golf with his four other, or three other golfing buddies. They were called the Dirty Four, and each Sunday, the Saturday golf earnings were put in the weekly, were put in by the weekly winner at the Presbyterian Church in the collection plate. And it's often wondered how much money those dirty four contributed to the church. Yard work was not high on dad's priority list and mowing the yard, that was it. Nothing more, just, just mowing the yard. Our family enjoyed many vacation times together and Christmas was probably one of the most special holidays that we all had and enjoyed being with one another. I remember my brothers and I could not go out and see what Santa Claus had brought us until all four of our grandparents had come over to the house on Christmas morning. We would sit in the back room and, and we would wait on our grandparents to come. And finally, we would get to go and open up our Christmas presents. And then after this, we always enjoyed Granny Walton's pancake breakfast. And we still have Granny Walton's pancake breakfast on Christmas morning. Mother and dad were the best cheerleaders my brothers and I could ever ask for. They supported us in all our school and our athletic activities. How many basketball games and other athletic events might they have attended? Lots, and that didn't stop with just us. When their nine grandkids came along and began participating in basketball, volleyball, tennis, school plays, etc. There they were, cheering and supporting each one of them. They made every effort to attend as many activities as they could. Many of you would probably remember the sound of sleigh bells ringing outside your house on Christmas morning. For many years, Raul would dress up as Santa Claus and mother would drive him around to houses all over town. He would run around jingling his, his sleigh bells, ho, 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 Merry Christmas. And he made lots of kids very happy. Santa, they would exclaim. And one girl, little girl even told her dad, look, there's a red light out there. I know it's Rudolph. And um, lots of children were just thrilled to see Santa Claus. And a lot of parents were thrilled to have Santa Claus visit their house. Dad, and then later Tom and Jack, enjoyed continuing this um, tradition of being Santa Claus on Christmas morning. Our parents taught their children to love, honor, and respect, not only them, but others also. Church and Sunday school were not an option for us. It was an every Sunday priority. Dad and mother saw their three kids graduate from college, marry the love of their lives, make them grandparents to five granddaughters, four grandsons, and enjoyed the birth of one great grandson. Dad passed away in December of 20, or 2000. My brothers and I were truly blessed by the two people who raised us, loved us, and guided us to be the adults we are today. Now, Tom's going to tell you a little bit about Dad's community activities. First, congratulations to the new inductees into the Hall of Fame. It's an outstanding 
group of people. I want to thank the Hall of Fame committee for electing my father, Raul Ransom, to this prestigious group. Winston Churchill once quoted, a city is not gauged by its lengths and widths, but by the broadness of its vision and the heights of its dreams. If your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more, and become more, you are a leader. I have always considered my father to be a leader. Throughout his life, my father participated in and helped guide many local and state organizations. Rawl, for over 50 years, was a member of the Frankfurt Country Club, serving as president and on the board of directors, seeing that the Country Club remain a strong part of this community. Along with these local leaders, Doug Scheid, Joe Doan, Jim Gore, Bob Hall Jr., Phil Harker, Bob Hall Sr., Gerald Gill, and Russell Harker, were responsible for the formation of the Frankfurt Development Corporation. This group of men started and grew the current Frankfurt Industrial Park. This group then organized and helped develop the Clinton County Land Trust which procured land to be available for future economic development. Rawl served on the local airport committee that brought the new airport to the west side of the community and placed it in the industrial park, now convenient for industry leaders to come and go from their corporate offices away from our city. In 1956, a group of 40 local community leaders met to explore the advantages of a county united way fund. Raw Ransom was elected chairman of the board of the newly created county organization. The name of the first organization was called Cuffey. Others serving on the first board were Lou Friedman, Bob Ryan, Doc Ertle, Bob Leishbrook, Wanda Barnett, Armin Wright. This organization eventually became the Clinton County United Way. Rawl, for several years, served on the board of the local Chamber of Commerce and later was elected president of the chamber. He became an active member of the Frankfurt JCs in 1941. He was an active member of the Frankfurt Rotary Club. He was a member of the board of directors and a past president of Rotary. He became a Paul Harris Fellow. He, along with Joe Doan and Millard Morrison, helped to start the Frankfurt Rotary Babe Ruth Baseball Program. In 1941, a parcel of land was donated to the county by George C. Cullum. The area became known as Camp Cullum. The result was a trust agreement transferring ownership and management of this property and forming the Clinton County Foundation for Youth in 1947. Rawl was a part of the group that formed this foundation. For many years, he found time to serve on the board of directors of Citizen Savings Bank and the Farmers Bank, the two largest financial institutions in our community. He served as president and chairman of the board of Kramer Lumber Company, a local business that began in his family in 1872. On the state level, Raw was president of the Indiana Lumber and Builders Supply Association, a group of over 350 lumber yards and hardware stores located across Indiana. He served as a director of the National Lumber Dealers Association in Washington, D.C. My father was a gentle, soft-spoken, humble person. He was a good listener and many times would wait till the right moment to make comments. When he spoke, we would listen. As one can see, my father dedicated much of his life so the residents and people of the Frankfurt community would have a better place to live. My father lived by this quote, 
giving back is something that comes from the heart to me. It's not that I do it because it is the right thing. I do it because I want to. They let the baby go last. <laughs> Raul was a man of faith. And two verses that would describe him would be Luke 10, 27. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Joshua 24, 15. And I think Sally and Tom have both alluded for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Ra was a follower of Jesus Christ and strived to live his life according to God's standards. He was active in the Presbyterian Church as a trustee, a deacon, an elder, and he taught high school Sunday school for many years back in the 50s and 60s and a little bit in the 70s. He was also a coach of the boys Presbyterian Church League team. This is an aside. Raw played, we've heard about Everett Case, Raw played for Everett Case in 1937 and 1938. As we all know, Frankfurt won in 36 and 39. Uh, <laughs> Raul alluded to the fact that a, a bounce of the ball or a, a, an official's call here or there, they might have had a chance to win in one of those two years, but uh, he had a lot of fond memories of playing for Everett Case. So I ran into a man recently and he shared that back when he was in high school, Raul would pick he and a couple of his friends up for church on Sunday morning. The rule was if you were not in church on Sunday morning, you couldn't play in the game that week. Now, we're not gonna speculate where this was illegal recruiting, but we're gonna just say that Raul was helping those young men build character and a good Christian foundation. Raul lived his fast through faith through compassion for others and generosity, and he loved to do things and give things to people without anyone knowing about it. Raul lived his faith by staying strong for others during times of adversity. Raul was a forward observer for the 774th Artillery Battalion in World War II. He served uh, all through Europe. He spent most of his time up on the front lines with the infantry calling back the coordinates of the enemy so that the artillery could shell them. On one occasion, after several days of heavy rain, the enemy artillery zeroed in on their position. After several hours of shelling, the men of the 774th climbed out of their foxholes to an amazing discovery. Not one man had been lost, and not one piece of equipment had been destroyed. I heard this story several times as I attended Rawls' army reunion with him. Several of the men always ended the story with, your dad always told us that we were saved by God's amazing grace. You see, the enemy shells had all imploded into the mud and exploded there. They had missed the target and none of the shrapnel had been able to explode and flow th fly through the air to maim and destroy. Raw's faith was a rock for many of his fellow soldiers to hold on to during those difficult times. And we found that as a family growing up and through our lives that Raw was that rock that we held on to. A favorite verse that his mom had given him was around underneath and above are the everlasting arms of love and God is love. He used that verse to give him confidence and courage all during his life. As Sally said, we were blessed to have parents who helped us understand the importance of faith and striving to live by God's standards. I also wanna congratulate uh, the other members who've been honored today. I wanna thank the community schools of Frankfurt, 
to the Don, Don, and Don for, for all their participation and all the alumni committee on behalf of Rawl and all the Ransom family. We're honored. Thank you very much. I personally want to thank the Ransoms. Um, as a young child, uh, Raul and Rosemary were our neighbors, and uh, um, I was a little adventurous child. And my parents woke up one day, and I was nowhere to be found. Uh, then their phone started ringing, and Rosemary had given my parents a call to say, uh, Tyler's over here in our driveway. And so they kept me uh, sheltered until I, my parents could round me up. And so I just want to thank them for making sure I was here today. <laughs> Our next inductee is Mr. Butch Ricker. He graduated in 1949. Ricker attended Purdue University on a track scholarship, but also joined the basketball team as well. Ricker returned to Frankfurt after college to be a teacher, but was named the athletic director where he stayed for 30 years. Ricker kept the athletic department in the black every year. He was also the mastermind behind the athletic complex we know today, right here behind the auditorium where the baseball field, the track, or the baseball and football fields and the track are uh, right behind us. Today, on behalf of Mr. Ricker, are his wife Shirley and their daughter Jolynn and their son David. Please welcome to the podium uh, Shirley, Jolynn, and David on behalf of Mr. Ricker. Before I begin, I would like to say, Tyler, he's doing a good job as an MC. So <laughs> I'm going to tell you about the race. This was a state champion race, 440 yard dash. He was a junior, and I went to the race. Well, they line up, no staggered starts like they do now, no all purpose tracks, it was a cinder track. They're all lined up at the starting line. And then when the, the uh, official uh, starter uh, shoots, shoots the gun and starts them off, they all go off at once, like a flock of geese. And they're running around. I couldn't even see him. I didn't know where he was. And they went on around the track. And then at about the 220 uh, position, he gets ahead. And then he leads the ra uh, finishes the race in the lead to the end. It was very exciting. Now you may wonder, he was a junior. Why didn't he win it as a senior? Well, he got the mumps and the measles in the spring of his senior year. Back in my days, we had bullies, and Butch had some bullies in his neighborhood, and they were some guys who picked on the kids, chased after him and everything, and I asked him, I said, well, did they pick on you? And he said, nope, they couldn't catch me, so... <laughs> mm. 
pretty amazing for 87, right? 86. I can't, 86? I can't keep up with her. Congratulations to this class. It's, it's a great honor to know most of you. And um, being a class member of the 1973 class, it's a special honor to be with Cindy and uh, Karen. There's no better people. Um, thank you for the uh, for the board for for uh, this great honor for my father. Uh, this weekend has been first class, but I would expect nothing more, especially from Don Stock. See, uh, Don was our student manager back in 70, um, 71, 72, and 72, 73 basketball seasons, and uh, he took it upon himself to call us the night before every game to make sure that we were in and on time and and uh, not out carousing around. And, uh, you know, it's attention to details like that. that uh, that's why we were winners, and uh, this is a winning, winning uh, organization. Induction into this Frankfurt Hot Dog Hall of Fame uh, would mean a lot to my dad. But I can hear him, hear him now saying, I don't know why, why me? Why me? Look, look at this group over here. Um, I'm not a famous actor. I'm not, I'm not a doctor who saved lives or delivered a lot of babies. I didn't control nuclear weapons. I was never a valedictorian or an NFL doctor or have a Super Bowl ring. I wasn't a fav fav uh, famous TV or radio personality uh, who was watched by millions. I wasn't a, uh, a president of a bank. I wasn't a war hero or a leader of the community. I wasn't a college All-American, and I didn't have a, be uh, a basketball court named after me. But uh, I'm sure be his being a state champion in the 440 is probably the major reason of him being elected to this hall. But I maintain being an athletic director for 30 years is just as important. He believed Athletics offered three important things, scholarship, law, lifelong friends, and, and uh, training for future life. You know, he didn't have an easy life. He lost his mother at two years old, but he had sisters to take care of him. He, he turned his athletic talents into a track scholarship at Purdue. He probably could not have attended college without that scholarship. He joined Sigma Chi fraternity, and there he, uh, he found some brothers rather than just the sisters that he had. He realized that others had the same opportunity he, would, he had the same opportunities that he used to get to the, uh, to the next level. To help these students, he would spend hours attending all the uh, sportings, not just the basketball, not just the football, but he'd be out there at the baseball, lining the baseball fields. He would uh, make sure the swimming people had everything they needed. I remember him um, sitting in the living room, uh, making names of opposing teams that would go up on the scoreboard, that would lower during sectionals, regionals, or special holiday tournaments. And again, he didn't have to do that, but it was one of those things. He just wanted to make sure everybody had the, everything first class. And he was proud when one of the, one of the hot dog students got a, um, received a scholarship. He had many lifelong friends from sports. And there would be many times he would introduce me to an old teammate, a coach, or an opponent. And I didn't realize how important that was until now. Um, you see, I've, I've got many lifelong friend, friends, too, from sports. And a lot of them are sitting here, like the Millhollands, the Kerseys, the Adamsons, the Davises, the Stoners, the Weirs, the Stocks, Cindy Ward, and Karen Miller. The Beardsleys, um, included the Beardsleys, too. Um, Heck, I even got to play golf with a Big Ten official who used to call my junior high games. I got to thinking about it sitting over there, and maybe it was because he took $20 from me, but... Uh, <laughs> I finally, believed, finally, Dad believed 
uh, sports were the great training ground for the future life. Uh, you learned a lot. Of, you learned how to work hard together. You learned how to win, and you learned how to lose. After after I left the nest uh, for my first job, he wrote he wrote a little note to me, and he says, uh, "Remember to work hard as you did in sports." Dad was intensely loyal, and I think he would have finished his speech with the following: Semper Fi. In hoc, boiler up, and proud to be a hot dog. When we decided that I would speak about the days following high school, there was one occasion that I knew I had to share. Mom was always great about planning family trips, so one summer we all went to Kings Island. There were three granddaughters at the time, Kate, Aaron, and Christy. Jenna wasn't born yet, all under the age of seven. After a day of rides, we walked along the midway and found a golf game. All you had to do was sink a 20-foot putt and you went a stuffed animal. Well, if you knew my dad, he was a pretty good golfer. He paid his money and received six golf balls. He made one hole in one. One happy granddaughter. He paid more money and got six more balls. He made one hole in one. Another happy granddaughter. And he paid more money and six more balls. And this time, he finished with three holes in one. He ended up winning five stuffed animals, and the owner asked him to stop, saying he had won too many. <laughs> but the memory of Dad and the girls holding their stuffed animals is priceless. So thank you so much from the Ricker family for this honor. Our next inductee is Ralph Vaughn. His name has been mentioned a few times today already. He graduated in 1936, leading the Hot Dogs to the state title as their top scorer. In all state selection, Vaughn led the North Central Conference in scoring in both his junior and senior seasons. Thanks to his coach, Everett Case, Vaughn became a great shooter. Leaving Frankfurt for sunny Southern California, Vaughn played at USC, leading the conference in scoring as a senior. In 1940, Vaughn led the Trojans into Madison Square Garden in front of a record-setting crowd of over 18,000 people. He scored 18 points as USC beat Long Island State, handing them their first loss in more than 43 games. The New York sports writers and Life Magazine both called Vaughn the greatest player in the country. Ralph's granddaughter was unable to attend today, so join me in a round of applause for this hot dog all-star.
Moving right along, our last inductee, but certainly not the least, Coach John Milholland. While Mr. Milholland is not a Frankfurt alumni, he is more than deserving of entry into the Hall of Fame. As an honorary inductee, Coach Milholland needs no introduction. His impact at Frankfurt High School can be seen all over. Merely walk into the gymnasium and see the, that the court embodies his name. Then look to the rafters and you'll see numerous years of basketball conference and tournament wins. After his illustrious coaching career, Mr. Milholland stayed at Frankfurt as an administrator until his retirement. Coach Milholland is a member of several Hall of Fames, including the Indiana High School Basketball Hall of Fame, but I bet Mr. Hall Milholland will tell us today that this is his most honored induction yet. Please welcome our coach, our principal, our hot dog, Mr. John Milholland. Okay, I'm the last one, and my wife told me, make it short and make it la light. So that's what I always do what she says, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'll try to do the best I can. I want to thank Don Stock, Don Rusk, and the committee for selecting me for this honor. And I want to, I want to give a special thank you to Don Stock. This is Don's dream of having a Hall of Fame alumni for Frankfurt. And he's worked very hard for it. And it's taken on a lot of faces until what you see right now this afternoon. So I want to, again, thank Don. And I'd like for you all to give him a round of applause for a great job. Also, I want to congratulate they are my fellow inductees, and it's truly an honor to be with them, and also to the inductees uh, for last year. Today, I'm being inducted with my best friend, a former son of my longtime assistant, Gary Kersey, Pat, a former boss, Dick Ricker, our hot dog cheerleader, former students, and a neighbor in Jim Minor. And you know, when you hang around as long as I have, you're bound to hit a bunch of them, and I, and I did tonight. I would like to recognize my wife, Connie, and my daughters, Lisa and Susan, and their families. And I would like for them to stand up. They probably won't do it, but They've had a lot to do with any success that I may have had. Can you imagine going to school with your dad as an assistant principal and a basketball coach, and also your wife on your staff of, of your teaching faculty? They had a pretty hard time going through school, and I'm sure they heard a lot of comments about their dad. I've had a wonderful partner in my wife, for 60 years. She's been my best friend, but she's also been one of my worst critics. And she also said I, she does that to keep me humble. Well, she's humbled me a lot of times, but I do appreciate it. Almost 51 years ago, Connie and I moved to Frankfurt. And when you say time really flies, it really does. In 1962, Connie and I were driving through Frankfurt on State Road 28, and we passed the new school and the new gym. And I looked over to her and said, boy, wouldn't it be great to be coaching in that facility sometime? And little did we know that in 1967, 
Five years later, I would be named the varsity coach and the tennis coach of Frankfurt, of Frankfurt High School. And yes, Janelle, I was a tennis coach for a few years. I had very limited knowledge. The principal asked me, do you know anything about tennis? Because you're the next tennis coach. I said, okay. But I inherited some great players. And I will tell you that in 1969, we did win the conference because it wasn't because of my coaching. It was because of the players that I inherited. For 33 years, I was a teacher, coach, principal of Frankfurt High School. And Connie, my wife, was an English teacher, business English, pep, uh, pep block sponsor, and spell boat uh, sponsor. And when we came back to all the reunions that we've come back to, they always uh, migrated to her and they wanted to know about business English and what a great time they had in the pet block. And, and when it came to me, they wanted, they asked me these questions. Do you remember when you suspended me from school? <laughs> Do you remember when you cut me from the basketball team? Do you remember when you had to come down and get me when I was truant from school? So we've had a lot of uh, good experiences. And you might say that Connie and I are die-hard hot dog fans. And you might even say we bleed blue. And, I, and you wouldn't really believe this, but when we take our blood test <clears throat> during the year, as, that, as we all do, you know, the lab technician is always amazed that our blood is blue and there's little blue and white hot dogs running around in <laughs> Well, I'm just kidding about the blue and white hot dogs, but, but it really was blue. People often ask me about our mascot and how it came to be. And when I first came to Frankfurt, our mascot was a dachshund dog, a kind of a weenie dog. And also sometimes it was a hot dog with a bun. So I approached a local sign painter, and he had to be an artist, Joe Sneedon. And I asked him to make us a fierce looking dog, an ag aggressive dog. So he did, and what you see on most of the apparel and all the middle of our gym floor, that's as a product of, of Joe Sneedon. And uh, he could have made a lot of money if he patented that uh, hot dog, because it's everywhere. But he was just happy that we were, we were happy with it, and he really did us a tremendous favor in doing that. And looking back, I can tell you that I truly love my job. And I thought it was really great getting paid for something you love to do. And I look forward to coming to school. But we joke about this a lot. And we joke about it in Kiwanis. We joke about it. We joked about it last night a little bit at the reception. That the hardest thing I had to do in coaching and and administration was to cut t k t kids from the basketball team, to discipline them during school, to suspend them or expel them. And that was a hard thing to do because I knew that it would have a lasting effect on them for, for many years. But most of them recovered and, w and went on to be uh, productive citizens and had a good life. And you know, some even came back and thanked me for some of the things that we did as far as discipline is concerned. It's been said that there are more good players make good coaches than good coaches make good players. And I really feel that is true. I don't know if they made me a better coach, but I do know I in was blessed for with a lot of good players and we won a lot of games and I always would be thankful for that. I always thought that there was more to basketball and education than just 
going to winning games and, and getting good grades. I tried to install in my players and students to be good citizens, to get along with others, to treat others with kindness, accept victory and defeat with dignity, make good choices, nurture their God-given talents. And we all have good talents, or some of us is hard to find. We have to look pretty hard to do it, but, but they're there. And I try to lead by examples, but I know I fell short many times, like when I ran on the floor and attacked officials, when I threw my coat up in the air, when I ran five or six bleachers up the bleachers and sit and pouted about over a call, or even calling, an, calling the officials during the game. But the worst one, and I think all my players will remember this, when I throw that, when I threw down my clipboard and said, hell's bells boys, what's going on out there? My coaching philosophy was to utilize each player to their fullest. Some were good shooters, some defense, some rebounders, some ball handlers, some were subs, and some were practice players. But all were important to the team and to win and the team concept. It didn't make much sense to me to, let, to have a 35% shooter shooting all the time when I had a 60 or 70 percent shooter on the team. And believe me, we had some great shooters. And I hesitate to mention any of them for fear I would miss of them. The only thing I, I really looking back, I wish we had the three-point line at that time because down over the years, we've really had some great, great players. Talking about role playing, one night we were playing Noblesville and we were having a particularly good night. And I had a, one of my players, his role was to rebound and also to get the weak side board and not to shoot two or three feet from the basket. And this particular night, we were really out on a run. Our fast break was working well. He came down the, the court fast, stopped at the free throw circle, let one fly, and um, he must have had a Dorner Park moment because that's what they did over there. And he knew immediately he was coming out for a little bench time. And he said after the game, he said, you know, coach, I really needed that. And thanks for taking me out because he came back and many times he was really high, high point scorer and led our team. When I was principal, I looked at our teachers, administrators, office personnel, custodians, food service, bus drivers as a team. And we were there to educate our students, none more important than others. I always felt good about it. My job was easy because we had great people. I had secretaries who knew what I was going to do on any given ca case before I even did it. So they already had it planned. They had the letters written. They had everything ready to go. So that was really something. We had a very close-knit group. With the expertise of administrators, and especially Mike Kelly, we were able to incorporate the trimester schedule that Mr. Edwards, I think, uses today with some variation. And in those days, that was a bold and really big change. And it was always attributed to our teachers who were willing to put our education and our students first and willing to take a risk and do something good for our students. I see many teachers here and school personnel here today and some of the players. And I, I won't ask you to stand, but I will, would like to tell you this, that any success 
that we've had during this school year and during my tenure, I can attribute to you. So really, this recognition that I'm getting tonight is really a recognition of what you have done for Frankfurt High School. Connie and I were just lucky enough to be here during that time. And we look at it as some of the best years of our life. In closing, I would, for Connie and I, I would like to thank you for allowing us to be part of your life during that time. And we will always cherish the fond memories we have of Frankfurt High School. And I would like to thank you and God bless you. give one more round of applause for both coach John Milholland and for the entire Hall of Fame class. Before we wrap up, we have uh, one more speaker. Uh, when we set up the Hall of Fame, we set it up to be uh, under the umbrella of the Frankfurt Education Foundation. And with that, we have Ali Mullins here, who's going to speak and say a few words about the community or the education foundation um, she was the former director uh, the current directors on maternity leave so ali was kind enough to uh, step up and wants to say a few words of both about the hall of fame and the education foundation and how we have paired those together ali all right thank you all for being here today I was a graduate of the class of 2003, so it's been so neat to hear the stories of fellow hot dogs and the amazing things that you guys are all doing to make the world a little brighter. The vision of the Education Foundation is to create a community without barriers to educational opportunities. Whether that's through scholarships for college, covering the admission fee for field trips to the Children's Museum for the elementary students at all the schools, or allowing teachers to apply for grants to fund specific needs in their classrooms, the foundation is here to serve the students of the community schools of Frankfurt. Without generous gifts from donors, bridging the gap to break these educational barriers would not be possible. As we've learned more about those who have gone on to be so successful, we've seen the importance of education. If you have the desire to help us support educational opportunities so we can ensure excellence for every student every day, please consider making a donation to the Frankfurt Education Foundation. We're so proud of the alumni who have joined us today and the many more that will be recognized in the coming years. Thank you to Don Stock and the Hall of Fame Committee for having the vision to put this all together. It will be such a great opportunity for the current students to be able to walk the halls each day and see that even though Frankfurt is a small dot on the map, if you work hard to chase your dreams, you can do really extraordinary things as these inductees have proven. And now I think Tyler has a few more closing notes to tell you about what's up ahead for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Allie. Of course, this day uh, would not be possible without uh, a lot of people who made this all happen. So on behalf of the Board of Directors, um, and these people are noted in your program as well, but I do want to make sure that I vocally say them out loud. Um, a special thank you to the students of Mr. Salee's radio and TV class. Um, not only are they recording today's um, ceremony, but they put together the videos uh, for each of the people. So uh, if we could give them a round of applause. <laughs> Obviously, we're in this beautiful theater that I alluded to earlier. Um, so thank you to Mr. Taylor, the theater director, uh, for allowing us to use this facility and for putting together uh, such a nice day for us here. Yep, go ahead. Also, there's uh, a reception afterwards, which I'll get to, and some different things throughout the evening. Um, but we want to thank uh, Applebee's, Diane Steining, Ruth Faust, and all the students at Frankfurt High School for their efforts in making the induction ceremony a special day for everybody. 
finally, today would not be possible uh, without our sponsors. Um, if you flip near the back, there's a sponsorship page. Um, our, so we're always looking for more sponsors. So if you want to get involved, as Ali said, please uh, feel free to contact us or look for a board member. Um, we would love to uh, continue to gain more sponsors and to really continue to make this more and more special every year. Those sponsors include the City of Frankfurt, the Farmers Bank, Goodwin Funeral Home, the Chamber of Commerce, Don and Susie Rusk, Jonelle Smith, Craig Mundell, Philip Saul and Tool, the Frankfurt Education Foundation, and Don and Tina Stock. So a round of applause for our sponsors. Also, these people uh, make our Hall of Fame class through nominations. In your program, there's a page for nominations and, and information of how you can get those nominations submitted to the Board of Directors. We encourage you and, and spread the word and, and tell everybody, nominate people. Obviously, we have 26 deserving people. There's plenty of more hot dogs that have gone out uh, to be great uh, members of our society and were great members of our society while they were students here as well. So please, please nominate people uh, so we can continue to induct those deserving members into the Hall of Fame. For the rest of the day, we are going to, first we're going to have the, the alumni lead out first so we can get a group photo of everybody um, from the class uh, before we do the plaque unveiling. So we're going to do a plaque unveiling out in the hallway. There will be a light reception in the cafeteria right down the hall. Um, and then everybody is also invited to the basketball game this evening, uh, which begins at 7 p.m. in Everett Case Arena. Uh, the class here will all be introduced before the game um, as well. So if I could get the house lights, we'll have the uh, class here uh, lead the charge out front first so we can get a group photo, and then we'll dismiss everybody else uh, so we can do the plaque unveiling and the reception. So. Thank you all for attending, and we look forward to seeing everybody next year. Thank you.
I'm losing my voice. So this is HGTV, and I am talking, I am talking, I am talking. I don't know for how long.